The Pacific Group is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and all members of the community are welcome to attend. The single most important aspect of AA recovery, however, is the principle of one alcoholic relating to another alcoholic. Therefore, only alcoholics actually participate in our meetings. If your primary purpose is other than alcoholism, we think it would also be helpful to you to contact an anonymous organization which more specifically deals with your addiction. In any case, we hope that what you learn here may be helpful to your recovery and or understanding. Good evening, my name is Allie and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Welcome to the Pacific Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. The format of this meeting is two 10-minute speakers, a coffee break, and a main speaker. Our first 10-minute speaker is Nancy J. Hi, I'm Nancy, alcoholic. Hi. Scared to death. And I know you guys don't care, and I don't care either that you don't care. So, <laughs> still scared. So, <sighs> I hope John doesn't regret this. Sorry, I'll try to do good. Um, I, you know, I grew up with, uh, well, in kind of an odd family. You know, we had, um, my mother was married three times and my father was married uh, four times. So, no, five times. So we had five and, and three and eight marriages between the two. And, you know, there was a lot of things that went on in childhood and, I probably was a good candidate from the beginning. I, the more I'm around here, the more I realize that I, uh, you know, got to the point of that I belonged here even when I was a kid. You know, I used to blame circumstances for the reason why I got here, but I know today that there is no circumstance that got me here beyond the fact that I'm an alcoholic, and uh, and that's what got me here. So. I am grateful that I know that today. It took me a long time to accept it, even in sobriety. And I used to, I, I got sober in August, finally got sober, August 28th of 1985. Hello to the class of 85. Um, you know, I'm not a speaker. I'm just going to start off right off the top. I know you're already aware of that. And... Uh, <laughs> But what I've learned around here is that I do have a lot to offer, and I do it much better one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm going to just pretend like I'm talking to somebody here, you know. Uh, my sponsor is Sharon Crane. She's been my sponsor for the last 15 years. And, uh, you know, I drank. I started out when I was a kid. Uh, I was a sick kid a lot. You know, there was a lot of things that happened in our house that, you know, shouldn't have happened to a little girl. And I won't get into that, but... Um, it did shape things for me for a while, you know, and uh, I also was a self-destructive kid, you know, and I kind of came, came up with that, you know, I realized that I was self-destructive by the time I was about seven or eight years old, and there were a lot of things that happened. I got to a point where I didn't care, you know, when I hit, by the time I hit uh, the eighth grade, it wasn't, I tried drinking at eight years old, I, I drank my brother's brandy, he gave me a sip, and I couldn't understand why anybody drank, you know, I did not like the taste of it, it wasn't something that appealed to me that I had to go out and have another one, and, uh, but later on, when I was 12, you know, I drank, I drank wine, I took wine to school, and I would steal it from my parents, I, um, they drank scotch, which I didn't like much either, so, but I did, uh, you know, we went to my friend's house across the street and we stole their alcohol because they drank vodka and I preferred that. Uh, I, you know, I hit and ran cars, my own, you know, I didn't know it. I didn't real. I was very indignant when I saw the dent in the side of my car and I didn't know that I did it, you know, and uh, I didn't realize that until much later. There were a lot of things that, you know, happened. I ended up hospitalized in institutions. I didn't go to jail for some reason besides Disneyland jail. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was Disneyland, but uh, it wasn't so much there. Um, I think as far as all of this goes, you know, I got sober 
when I was 25. I started coming around the programs. My work sent me at 20 years old because I guess the president of the bank didn't think he should have to carry me out of the bathroom or carry me to my car or go pick me up from home to take me to my car. <laughs> that first drink that I actually really enjoyed was I think at the age of 13 and I uh, took, uh, it was, it was, I was just drinking beer and all of a sudden I just felt good. I, you know, had a scarf on, I took off my, my clothes and I ran through the neighborhood naked. The streaking was really popular then. So, you know, but I, I was very modest. So that was very unlike me to do stuff like that. Later on, um, you know, I got to the point where, you know, I ended up in a mental institution when I was 20 years old and, I had a lot of other outside issues that I was always dealing with. And I've had a lot of outside issues while I was in this program. You know, that this program has actually helped me with some, some things I had to get outside help for. But I, I know that today, uh, you know, I just wish I could remember my story right now, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> And, you know, there was, when I got sober, I remember standing in line at the grocery store and they had like People magazine or some magazine that had Elvis Presley and Rock Hudson on the front of it. And I turned to the lady ahead of me and I just said, God, they're talking about them like they're dead or something, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and it turned out Elvis had been gone. This was 1985, you know, <laughs> he'd been gone for a while and... I know that, you know, as far as, as far as all of that was concerned, you know, I stayed for three months into UCLA. I got let out of there, and I still didn't stop drinking. I still got to the point where I just was, I finally came around here. The first time I tried to get sober, I... Uh, I had gotten there was I had come home somebody had done an intervention on me and that night lo and behold that night uh, everybody that I partied with got busted and sent to jail and some convicted for a couple of years in Ch Chino and I missed it because I was having an intervention you know <laughs> and I mean I was grateful for that but I still at that point I thought I had a drug problem I didn't think I had really an alcohol problem yet but I didn't seem to be able to stay sober and every time I drank I didn't have the power of choice on what happened after that you know I woke up with people I didn't know and I ended up up in places I don't know how I got there and I ended up I had tried to gas myself in my house I lived in a little guest house and I had uh, sealed the sealed underneath the doorways and had laid down on my couch and was just gonna go and all of a sudden uh, something got me to make a call and I made a call to somebody I had been, you know, my work had sent me to the program five years before this, but I didn't want to go because I didn't feel like I was an alcoholic. And when I went to uh, get up, you know, to call this gal, her and him came and they pulled me out of that gas house and I don't know what happened, but you know, I kept telling him I was still fighting being an alcoholic. I fought being an alcoholic for a long time. I wasn't happy being sober, you know, and it wasn't until I was 19 years sober that I heard Clancy share in a on a tape once that, you know, if you got sober and your life turned out great, you know, everything got better after that, maybe you're not really alcoholic, you know, and that was the first time I'd ever heard anybody say that. I always I spent the first 19 years with the people in my group feeling like an outsider because everybody seemed to be well all the time and I couldn't get there even with 19 years of sobriety. I met my sponsor at that time and, you know, I just ended up where my, you know, while I was in another hospital, I was in, actually before all that happened, I ended up in a recovery house when I was uh, three years sober because I had tried to kill myself in sobriety. And when I went into doing that, you know, I met my husband <laughs> in recovery, uh, in, the re in the rehab. And, um, you know, of course, that's where all good relationships begin. And, uh, 
You know, we came home, we got married, we had three kids. I inherited two of his from his first marriage, and uh, we had a sober life off and on, but he wasn't able to get this, you know, get the, get sober from this, and uh, I got a chance to see a lot of things firsthand, and I, you know, he passed this last December because of this disease as a direct result. He was drunk, and even the next day when he hadn't even had a drink, he was at a point three two, you know, and that day later. And so, you know, it's like this disease is going to kill us if we don't get it. And I'm so grateful that I get an opportunity to sponsor the women I get to sponsor, that I have the AA sisters I have, and that uh, I have the sponsor that I have. And I'm sorry. I hope I didn't disappoint you too much. I love you all, though, and thank you for my life and my sobriety today. Our second 10-minute speaker is Jeff B. My name is Jeff Blair. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and I thank John for asking me. And um, so my story starts in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was part of a big Catholic family, and um, that's the heart of bourbon country. So, you know, that wasn't a problem. Uh, my earliest memory as a kid was really just being, uh, I was reasonably intelligent, I felt like, and reasonably athletic, but I was kind of emotionally disabled, I felt like, as um, I just couldn't deal with my emotions even at an early age. I remember, you know, playing in the backyard and uh, uh, playing with the kids and just always being really uptight or getting in fights or overreacting to things. And it was that way from my earliest memory. And the only thing that really helped me at that age was playing sports before I started to drink. So I had this, I always had this feeling of uniqueness of, I felt like it, I wasn't all bad, but... I just didn't understand myself at all. I didn't have any self-awareness whatsoever. And so all during my youth uh, until I started to drink, I had these feelings of being very uptight and uncomfortable in my own skin and restless, liberal, and discontented. As soon as I saw that big book, I totally related to that and understood it. And then when I got to be 13 or 14, I went to a, a first real drunk. I think it was a freshman in high school. And got completely drunk, blacked out, uh, threw up, uh, lost the jacket I had on, uh, my body was covered in mud, my face was, was cut, and I hit on the guy's mom who's having the party. <laughs> you know, she was probably 40 years old or something at that time, and I was 14, and, um, you know, ended up in this rocking chair and kind of rocking back over, and, you know, it was just kind of a disaster, and the next day, you know, stayed in our basement and uh, all day until it was dinner time, basically, and I hadn't come up, and my face was all cut up, and I, I didn't know what to say, and my dad asked me, you know, what happened, and I, I couldn't speak. I was, I was tongue-tied, and he, he said something like, boys will be boys, or something like that, and so I said, yeah, that's right, and um, so that was my story the rest of my drinking career, boys will be boys, I guess, but... During that age, uh, I was playing sports. I played football and played football into college even. And so I had this kind of uh, dual life, I guess, where I'd lift weights and do all that stuff. And uh, But then would, on the weekend, go and get completely drunk and blacked out almost every weekend when I was in that age in high school. And first time I got my driver's license on a Tuesday or something like that. And on Friday night, I was driving in a blackout on the freeway. And Saturday night, I drove in the blackout on the freeway. And so I was an alcoholic pretty much from the get-go. And just what happened was the frequency of my drinking increased over time. When I was first started, I was just drinking, you know, once once a week or not even that much. Once, probably twice a month, uh, maybe uh, three times a month. And then slowly and steadily, that increased. But my drinking was always to the blackout stage almost from the very beginning. And so... I went through high school and went off to college, went to this small college to play football primarily, and first night there I was passed out in the bushes with some female and uh, was in the dean's office the next day, you know, the first first week I was there. And 
This is also also the time when, um, you know, I was never a good worker when I was drinking. I was in, incapable of working. Um, I tell the story where one of the jobs I had that was about all I could handle was I was the Kentucky State Fair Bear one year. <laughs> and as the Kentucky State Fair Bear, you travel around to these little cities in the state to promote the state fair, to get people to come and spend money at the fair. And so you're wearing this big, hot costume, and you know, it's like in the south, 95 degrees, 95% humidity, and you're, you know, I'm either, I wasn't usually drunk, you know, in uniform, but uh, I was usually intensely hungover, and these little kids would come up and stamp on my foot or my paw. Um, and I would try to scare them, and uh, without without their parents hearing, and so I'd growl at them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that was about as well as I could do when I was drinking. And so went through all my college years just in a constant blackout. I mean, four years of, black, of drinking, you know, almost every day, and I don't know how I graduated, but somehow I did. And I always tell the story of, um, you know, for most people, college graduation is – one of the highlights of their life, I guess. You know, the parents are there, grandmother's there, and that was, was my situation. Only, the only difference was um, before I went on stage, the dean of students told me I was going to get arrested when I came off the stage. I was not going to get a diploma, and I had been drinking seven days in a row just as much as I possibly could. And it was, again, like in the south, and the summer is very hot and very humid, and so I'm just sitting up there detoxing and just miserable and you know, waiting to get arrested, and I was able to finagle my way out of that like I did many things, but um, that was just kind of the way it went for me. I got out of a lot of things, but I was, you know, I just couldn't really function in the world without alcohol. I, at the end, I couldn't even go into a 7-Eleven without alcohol, and so uh, around those last two years, I saw a psychiatrist, psychologist, and tried to quit drinking, would quit drinking for 30 days, 60 days, and just when I quit drinking, I would, that's when it would get worse, as we, all, as we all talk about in here, and that isolation would come out, and so drinking allowed me to talk to people and go out and do things, but when I quit drinking, all that, all that uncomfortableness that I talked about when I was a kid would come back, and so I, got, I felt like I got to that point where I couldn't live with it, and I couldn't live without it, and that's, that's where we all come to eventually, I guess, and so that's where I was. And I was, you know, drinking in bars a lot and staying out really late. And I just remember, like, sitting in uh, this one bar that had a big video screen. And uh, that Sinead O'Connor song, Nothing Compares to You, was on. And, you know, the saddest song ever recorded. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Back there, the bars are open until 4 a.m. So I'm sitting there at, you know, 3.30 a.m. or whatever and, you know, just miserable. And at that time, I was, I was suicidal. I'd never been su- When I was a kid, I was not suicidal at all. I uh, never thought about it. And but at this time I was suicidal and I was had been seeing like all these different people and nothing was working because I wasn't allowing it to work. And so I uh, had a friend that she was sober and she was always asking me to go to a meetings and um, because she knew she knew by my pattern of trying to stop drinking on my own and and going back. And she just saw me. And so she knew what was what was up with me. And so for one one day, for whatever reason, I, I went I don't know why, and I remember going to that first meeting, and I just have such vivid memories of, you know, the people talking, and I'm, I didn't understand the language. It, it felt like it was a cult to me or some type of religion or something, and on the other hand, I heard people talking like I am tonight and telling things that I'd never heard anywhere. I'd never heard a, anyone in a church say this stuff. I'd never read anything like this in a book, and I completely identified with the alcoholic uh, drinking and behavior and emotions and all that stuff. And so I had completely uh, angel on one shoulder, devil on the other, devil saying, you know, this place is a cult, don't come back. And the angel saying, you know, yeah, that's true. Uh, that might be true, but uh, no one's ever, uh, you've never heard this before. And that was true. No one had ever, I'd never had that sense of identification in my entire life that I could remember. And so for whatever reason, I came back the next night, and I always feel like that's the, the best thing I've ever done in my life or the, the best thing that's ever happened to me because I got real involved in Alcoholics Anonymous. It, I was living in Cincinnati, Ohio. Got super involved there. My sponsor was really, really into the big book and really into working the steps, so he almost immediately had me working the steps. And I, um, within the first year, I'd worked all my, all my steps, and I just have several memories of that first year that were real 
clear. One, I, when I was drinking, I always looked at the ground when I talked to people. I always felt really uncomfortable. And the other thing for me is every time I drank, I pretty much did something that I regretted. Sometimes it's something very small, like, you know, saying something smart out to someone. Sometimes it was getting indecent exposure in Taco Bell parking lot. That happened one time. Um, or sometimes it might be having a gun pulled in my face, and that happened happened more than once. And so, but at that seven months sobriety, I'd been working the steps, and like I said, I looked up, and I started looking people in the eye. When I had 11 months sober, I woke up one Sunday morning, and I had nothing, no money, cars worth $500, living in this basement of this uh, woman that I was renting this thing from, and I had no anything, I just had this sense of peace come over me. And uh, I'd never had that in my entire life. And so that was due to the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the sponsorship. And I was experiencing a spiritual experience. And now, 28 years later, I'm still sober. And I'm very grateful for Clancy, for his sponsorship for a long time, and for Alcoholics Anonymous, and for sobriety. It's the most important thing in my life. And thank you all. Our main speaker tonight is Johnny H. Hi, everybody. My name is Johnny Harris. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Glad to be here tonight. Glad to be sober. Uh, I want to thank my friend John for the privilege of participating at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It's my opinion, and I hope it always remains such, that it's some type of privilege to be allowed to come and sit in this room every week. I hope I don't ever get it through my sick head that I have a right to everything that goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Just because I was lucky enough to stumble in here and get sober and stay that way. And I only tell you that because everything that's good and decent in my life, everything, is the byproduct of the God I discovered sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight, fully clothed and in my right mind. <laughs> it wasn't always that way, and uh, if I'm not real careful about that, what was read here tonight, I may end up in the same place again. Uh, Sixty years ago, tonight, 60 years ago, about this time, I was strapped down on the bed in the Los Angeles County Jail. I was 26 years old, and the medical profession said I was going to die. That didn't seem like a great idea or a bad idea to me because I didn't want to go on living the way I was living. And so I didn't know what to do about it. I sat in that bed, laid in that bed for a couple of nights, three nights, a few periods of time. I don't know how much it was. And one night, because I knew nothing better to do, I screamed out the only prayer I ever said in my life. I said, oh, God, help me. Now, there was no blinding or flashes of lights. Nobody come running down the hall with a dozen donuts or a court card. <laughs> I just went to sleep for a little while, and I got better and better and better. A couple of weeks later, I might run around the jail looking for some more of the poison to put me back on. I better just got an off of. I didn't understand what went on for the next two years of my life. I thought I had lived in hell for most of my life. I took, lived in a little town in Kansas. I remember as a child standing with my hand in my grandmother's hand, standing in a line getting free cheese from the government because that's all there was to eat. I was telling somebody at lunch today, I remember following my mother in a potato patch where she picked potatoes so we could have something to eat. And how ashamed I was of all that. And how I had to go to penitentiary to see my namesakes and my uncles and my aunts and the things that they were doing. And, and how ashamed I was. And what brought on the shame even more was the guilt I felt for being ashamed because I knew I wasn't supposed to. And because everybody else was the same state I was in. That was what they call the Great Depression. And I didn't understand what was going on, real crowd, and I didn't understand what was going on. And 
my grandmother took me to church. I didn't understand what was going on in church. She told my little boys were were punished, who were bad, and, and and I didn't understand that, but that just created more guilt because I hadn't done anything. And I lived to a certain period of time when death seemed like a good idea. Probably if it didn't happen to me, if I hadn't taken that first drink of alcohol, I'd have probably blown my brains out before I was nine years old. And it was given to me by my grandfather, who made it, and uh, that stuff did something for me that carried me through the next 20 years of my life into a life of hell and stuff that I couldn't understand. It, it removed the guilt from my system for a period of time. And I ended up where I always end up when I drink. I ended up locked up in a reform school in Hutchinson State, Kansas. And my mother came and took me out of that reform school and brought me to California. And things weren't any different in my home than they were in Kansas, so I went out on the streets and found some people to hang out with, and the next thing I know, I'm in juvenile hall. It went on and on and on. I got involved with some people in juvenile hall that I shouldn't be involved with. We were all engaged in a zoot suit war. Most of you don't know what that was, but it was in the early 40s. And I got into this group of people, and I stayed with them for the next 19 years of my life. And I came out, reform school, took a drink, and got locked up again. That's we had to, I'm standing here tonight without any alcohol or moved all any chemicals in my system for a long, long time. And right after this very minute of my life, I've never quit drinking. I never thought about it. I never wanted to because it was the only thing in my life to remove the guilt that I had that I knew I shouldn't be doing or living the way I was living. And I didn't understand what was going on because I've had some of the best psychiatric treatment that the state of California and the federal government has ever produced. And their answer to me, Johnny, if you didn't drink, you wouldn't have any problem. What most of these great men never knew, and it's something that I learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is when they were telling me this, I was as physically sober right then as I am now. And I didn't understand, but just what happened led on to the idea that nobody knew what was wrong with me. That I was some type of an oddball or dropped off from some place out of hell to run the muck in this life and destroy everything that come near and dear to me. And the people who were supposed to know everything about everything didn't know nothing about what was wrong with me. And I wandered in and out of this thing after that prayer in that deathbed of mine in the Los Angeles County Jail. For the next two years, I lived in a hell that I hope nobody ever has to live in. And I hope I never forget the hell that I lived in for the next two years. And this is what the hell was. I wandered around in the world doing the things I'd always done, and my really I put that was I had gone too far. I had crossed lines that no human being should ever cross and expect to get any type of help from God. And he washed his hands with me, and I'm going to have to walk through this hell and this guilt for the rest of my life, or in eternity, I guess, is what they tell me in religion. And I didn't know what was going on. November the 4th, 1959, I'm sitting on a little knoll in a penitentiary. And I'm surrounded by my righteous partners who've been there with me since juvenile hall. And we're sitting there waiting for the connection to come off the visiting room so we could do what we do. We just sit around and wait, wait for something to happen. Like a lot of people come to Alcoholics Anonymous, just sit around here and wait for something to happen to them. Let me tell you, if you're an alcoholic phenomenon, it's already happened. Everything you need for recovery in alcoholic phenomenon, you brought in here with you. All you got to do is uncover, discover, and discard. Clean house, trust God, and help others. And somehow or other, you recover from this seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. I didn't know that that day. Because I saw some women walk across the yard and for some unknown reason, I just got up and followed them into an old Quonset hub building. 
And I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know it. Just saw these people. You know, they, they had a couple of women with them, and uh, that's always attraction when you're in the penitentiary. You see women walk across the yard. And I, I went and sat down on this thing. What I didn't know, and I've come to understand in the last 50-some years of my life, that was the beginning of that prayer that I made in my deathbed that I thought I'd gone too far what was going to happen to me. Because my life had never been the same since that day. And you know, I was told once upon a time by somebody I loved a great deal that angels are messengers of God. And this group of people that day were the ugliest angels you've ever seen in your life. I mean, they, I don't know why they were doing it, what they were coming up to this penitentiary for, what they were doing coming up there. I had a lot of little blue-lipped people talk at me at bars about getting Jesus and all this other kind of stuff. But I didn't understand any of this kind of stuff. I didn't understand why they would get in their cars and drive 100 miles up this old back road and spend two hours talking to a bunch of people who didn't want to listen to them. But they brought something with them that recovering alcoholics bring to Alcoholics Anonymous. Drinkers sometimes don't bring it because it's a necessity for them. But they brought some type of a spiritual axiom about them that I didn't understand. It took me a long time to realize that's the way my grandmother looked when she came back from church every Sunday. And I moved in and sat out in the back row where people like me sit. I didn't want to move up too close. Somebody might think I'm a member of this, and I don't know what it is anyhow, and I'm not going to join nothing. I saw two big A's up there, and I thought, my God, I wandered into an anti-aircraft brigade. I didn't know what this was. I said, the clown sat next to me. What is this? He says, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I sunk down in my seat because I didn't want anybody to see the big gangster hanging out with these winos. Got a reputation that I've lived a lifetime and done a lot of deeds for, and I wasn't about anybody to see me sitting in an AA meeting. Heaven forbid that I'll ever reach out for any type of help. I didn't know what was going on here. But something about that day infected me. I don't know what it was, but it was near, very nearly my last meeting. I, I sit there. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I sit in this meeting, and I don't know what's here. I don't know what Alcoholics Anonymous is. I don't know what an alcoholic is, but these people say they're alcoholics. Okay. And the first guy I got up to talk said something that almost took me out the door and almost became my last meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what he said. That's been a long, long time ago, and I can hear it just like it was yesterday. He said, I hear it all the time today. I used to drink. Now I don't drink. And everything is just wonderful. I'm sitting in the back row about two steps away from a straitjacket, and it ain't all right with me, and I'm as physically sober as he is. So I don't know, so I thought, there's nothing here. I'm not alcoholic. These people are alcoholics. They seem to be getting something out of it. But I don't know what it was. Maybe the power of that prayer I made in my deathbed kept bringing me back on Sunday to a different group of people. I wasn't an alcoholic, and I wasn't going to buy your program. I'd sit back there in the back row and make fun of them. I had a lot of fun going. You know, they say you used to drink. I'd say, yeah, I bet you did. Bad stuff, too. See, I knew everything when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm a walking encyclopedia of useless information. And I don't know what's going on, but I do know how to make fun of people so I don't have to look at me because I can't stand me. And one day a little man walked in that I knew did 23 flat years in the penitentiary. I saw him walk out of the penitentiary a few years before that, and I told him, you can't make it out to old man, he won't let us. And he stood at a podium of Alcoholics Anonymous, a little man, a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, his name was Les Hamlin. And he said this, you don't have to live like this no more if you don't want to. That's all he said. You don't have to do it like this. No, nobody had ever said that to me. All they ever said to me, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, you'll be all right. Even when I wasn't doing it, I wasn't all right. 
And after the meeting, I did something that I had never done before. I walked up to this little man only because I knew him. He was my baseball coach when I was a star second baseman for the San Quentin Pirates for a couple of years. <laughs> I put that on a resume. You ought to saw that guy's reaction to it one day. <laughs> and I said to him, how do you learn how to live? I wasn't interested in being sober from that day to this. Not at all. Sober is my sanctuary. It's not my sanctuary. Drinking is my sanctuary. Sober is hell. And I don't understand that. And he, he looked at me and he said, Johnny, there's a book in the library called Alcoholics Anonymous. If you go get that book, I'll go home and pray that you find some part of you in it. Okay. So I went to the prison library the next day and stole the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm trying to protect my image. And my image doesn't want my name alongside of anything as lame as Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't know what's going on, but I took the book and went back and started to read it. And I didn't read it to find some way to live or get incorporate some spiritual principles into my life so I could live in some type of a world without the use of some type of alcohol or drug. And I didn't understand what was going on. And I opened the book to read it. I was going to come back to you and tell you that my case was different. It wouldn't work for me, which is a great, it's a great detriment to a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous today. They're alcoholic and something or other. You can't be different here and stay here. I've learned that the hard way. You just have to be like one of us. Just an alcoholic. Nothing big, nothing special. You know, it said, in, it said in what was read tonight in the tradition that our leaders are trusted servants. They don't govern nothing here. Servants are people who have to serve, not come in here and take because they think they have a right to it just because they don't drink anymore. So I don't understand all that, but I was going to come back to you with this book in my hand until it wouldn't work for me because my case is different. But before I could do that, I was laying there reading it one night, and I read it. My eyes fell upon something, and this is another answer to this prayer. My eyes fell upon the doctor's opinion. And I read the doctor's opinion, and the doctor, and they, one of God's servants to us, the doctor explained very clearly in that book what was wrong with me, what happened when I drank. What happened to me when I didn't drink? And the doctor's statement in that book was very simple. Unless I could have an entire psychic change, there would be very little for my recovery. And somehow or other, I got the idea that the entire psychic change was somewhere in that book, incorporated in those 12 steps they read at every meeting. So I got busy getting the book out and trying to do practice the principles that the book lays out for us to practice. I didn't think about asking anybody for help because I didn't think I deserved anybody to help me. I thought, I'm just it. I've just gone too far. And I found myself, after I read that thing in the book, The Doctor's Opinion, that day, that night in that little cell in that penitentiary a long time ago in the darkness, I came to the conclusion that everything that happened to me in my life was my fault. I'm responsible for all of my actions, bad, all of them. I'm the one that did it. I'm the one who drank it. I'm the one that used it. I'm the one that did everything. I'm the guy who committed the atrocities in that gang I ran with. I'm the guy that did the things that I did. I, alcohol didn't make me do that. Alcohol gave me something to overcome the guilt that my action brought about. And for lack of a better word, what it is, is an illness, a spiritual illness the book talks about, a malady, not a disease, because I cannot blame something, something you can get catch from somebody else. The book talks about it very specifically. So I went about trying to find this 
psychic change they talked about. And I found myself walking out of a man's office where I spent three and a half hours with him talking about every rotten, filthy, corrupt thing I'd ever done. And I found myself telling this man things that would have probably kept me in the penitentiary for the rest of my natural life. And I only did that for one reason. My book, Alcoholics Anonymous, tells me I got to be searching and fearless and thorough because I'm trying to walk the world as a free man. And I'm not talking being outside of an institution. That's not freedom. Being free is right here inside of me. Freedom from guilt, freedom from guilt from shame, willingness to be doing something as one of God's kids doing something to help somebody else for nothing. That's what freedom is all about here. And I didn't know that. I didn't know I was off for launch in this thing. I spent the next year and a half of my life in that penitentiary trying to clean up the wreckage of my past with the police departments and the DEA and all them other people who may have had something hanging over my head that I didn't know about. June the 4th, 1961, I walked out of the penitentiary. I walked out of the penitentiary for the first time in my life. I walked out of an institution without a girlfriend and a drug connection standing at the corner where to take me with them. There was an old man from Alcoholics Anonymous who came up there to visit me, come home, pick me up, and took me to see my mother, who fell off the steps blind drunk. I picked her up and put her on the couch, said, Mom, I'm going to an AA meeting. She said, fine, I think you should. I watched my mother drink herself to death here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not a pretty thing to watch an alcoholic drink themselves to death, particularly somebody you care for. And I went to a meeting one night, and a guy walked up to me by the name of Norm Alpe, who comes to the penitentiary, and, and told me he was going to be my sponsor. Well, I didn't see anything in the book about the sponsor, you know, and I didn't understand what he was talking about. And I said, well, what tell you? So I'm going to help you get things done, Johnny. And I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, why do you ask me? I said, you just told me you were going to be my sponsor, Norm. What do you want me to do? He said, why do you ask me? I said, what do you do? And he said, why don't you just do what I do? And I said to him, what is it you do? Anyhow. <laughs> And he just was next, this is the answer. He said, well, if you do what I do, then you will know what I do. <laughs> I just broke up the great mystery of sponsorship to you. I had no concept about what it was. First thing he said to me is get a job and go to work. You're a bum. <laughs> I told him, I'm not a bum. He said, what are you? I said, I'm an AA member. He said, you're an AA bum. Bums don't work. <laughs> Get off of welfare. I told him, I've never been on welfare, Norm. If you ever tell me that again, I'm going to hit you. I'm about ready to hit you anyhow. And he said, uh, what do you call living in penitentiaries, Johnny? Self-supporting through your own contributions? <laughs> he had an answer for everything. He said, I couldn't drive a car because I didn't have a driver's license. I told him, I've never been arrested for driving without a license. He said, well, why do I have to not have a car? He said, well... Citizens like me have a right to be protected from jerks like you who think you have a right to everything because you don't drink anymore. Oh. Jeez. He says, how long has your license been suspended? I said, for the rest of my natural life. <laughs> he says, okay, then you're going to have to get somebody to take you to meetings. For a while, I had to ride my little girl's bicycle to meetings. That's awful nice, big-time gangster driving through his old neighborhood riding a girl's bicycle with a little bell on it. <laughs> there's, there's six your old homies over there saying, Ooh-wee, Johnny, that ain't really works, don't it, baby? <laughs> I don't know. My sponsor asked me one time, he said, How long have you been sober, hotshot? I said, 19 months? No, you haven't. He said, you may have been dry for 19 months, but you haven't ever been an Alcoholics Anonymous. 
He says, you can't live in a penitentiary and be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Members of Alcoholics Anonymous have things to do. Members of Alcoholics Anonymous come to meetings on their own. They don't have to wait for meetings to come to them. He went on and on with this great litany. So he told me the day I walked out of the penitentiary was the day I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. Even though to the best of my ability, I had made a big attempt on the first nine steps of our program of recovery. But that's a program of recovery. That's not the fellowship. See, this is where the sponsor plays the biggest role that you'll ever have in your life. They will show you how to live in a spiritual fellowship and take the action that you must take if you want to obtain and maintain any degree of dignity here. And that's what he did. He gave me a rule to live by. And he lived by the rule because I watched him. And long about that time, there was an old man who came into my life who basically adopted me uh, because I never had much of a father, not much of a family. And I was given a mom and dad here in Alcoholics Anonymous, both my papa and my mom. And uh, he taught me things that a papa or a father teaches a son that nobody else, uh, he was, you know, I, I miss him every day of my life. I miss him particularly long about this time every year. And I rode around the cars with him and listened to him talk to me about things that I didn't even understand. I thought sometimes he was crazy, but he talked to me about things that are really important. I rode around the cars with him. Every once in a while, I'd try to mimic on something he told me. And he'd say to me things like, I didn't say it that way, son. So I quit saying anything. And one night I was staggering around out there by the literature table, which can be dangerous sometimes to an idiot like me. And I picked up this pamphlet. We were in Santa Maria, and he's talking, and we were riding back, and I said to him, and I got him in the car. It's 11 o'clock at night. We're both full of coffee, so we're wide awake. So I'm going to read him this pamphlet. I said, I read this to you, Papa. He said, okay, son, what is it? He said, why we were chosen? He didn't even bat an eye. He just said, throw it out the window. <laughs> I said, why? He said, what makes you think you're chosen? I said, it says right here, we're chosen. He said, what makes you think you're chosen? I said, because I'm sober. He said, what makes you think you're chosen? I said, I know people who are better people than I'll ever be, and my mother's one of them, and she's not sober. Well, I'm not chosen. He said, Johnny, you're sober because you've come to understand you're one of God's kids, and you act like it. Come debate, debate with my pop. I said to him, what do God's kids act like, pop? He's very simple. He said, God's kids help God's kids get things done that need to be done, and they do it for free, and they do it for fun. What a novel concept to do something expecting nothing in return. It's what the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is really all about. And I never have forgot that thing. I've, I've had him for 25 years of my life. 25 years. And the year before he died, Norm died. And I run around here like a lot of people do, thinking I had the best in the world, which I did. Now I'm sponsoring a lot of guys. I'm on the speakers to run around out there building their egos up. And I really get to thinking I'm something and my two anchors would let me get that way. And I didn't know what to do, and I'm getting a lot of appointments, so I had involved in something that I didn't like what was going on there, and so I decided I was going to resign from the committee of this thing. And uh, But I didn't quite know, because I had so many years of having 
the great direction. And I wrote a letter of resignation to this committee that I was in. And I didn't know whether I should mail it or what to do, so I called my friend Clancy, who I'd been friends with for quite a while. And I said, I want to come down and talk to you. So I walked into the mission and I told him what was going on. And all of a sudden, I got to thinking, why do I need a sponsor? I've already got that action. I'm about that close to being dead that I've ever been before in sobriety. 22 years sober, actively participating member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm almost that dead because I've got this ego so bad because I think of what's going on around me that I'm involved with is all I need to see what's going on. And I turned to walk out of Clancy's office. I never will forget this if I live to be 200 years old. And I stand at the doorway and I look back at him and I said, Clancy, I need a sponsor. I thought he was going to look at me and say, what an order. I can't go through with it. <laughs> so we made a little pact that day and I said to him, what do you want me to do? Do you know one of the questions Clancy asked me? He said, do you count your time in the penitentiary? And I said, no, Norm said I couldn't. He said, that's a good idea. You're in the fellowship, but you weren't in the fellowship. You were just reading a book and taking steps. The big difference. So we've been together almost 36 years now. And every time I need something to be explained to him, my sponsor's always been there. Told me to come to this meeting, be of service, call him. And up until the last three or four months, I called him practically every day. And the miraculous part of my life is hard for me to understand. Because the thing that has really happened in my life over all 50, almost 58 years now of being around you is, is not only do I believe in God, I trust him. And I trust him more today than I ever did because now I've got a record over my shoulder of how he's taken care of me since the day I walked in with you in November of 1959. Given me things to do. He's given me a beautiful home and a lovely wife who was here today. Because I learned to love people like you and my sponsor, I learned to love my wife was a no hold bar kind of situation. And I remember one time I went to see Papa. I didn't know what was going on because I didn't. My children's mother had just committed suicide and I was afraid to engage in any type of relationship anymore because I knew me, I destroyed everything I ever cared about in my life. And I said, you and Mom have a perfect marriage. I don't know what you do, but will you please tell me what you do so I can at least try to practice it. He said, okay. He said, when I got sober, he said, I went to Miss C and I told her, if she would allow me to love her, I'd never ask her to do anything. You know, it's been a long time since I heard that word from that man and I'm starting to get the idea that that is a perfect way to live in a relationship. It is the most miraculous thing I know what I've learned from you. But you've shown me more than taught me anything. You've shown me how to behave. You've shown me to take what I learned here where my life is in jeopardy, out there when it's not in jeopardy, when it's in jeopardy more out there than anywhere else. If I don't learn to do it here where my life is in jeopardy, how in the world do you think I'm ever going to behave anywhere else but here? You know, I hear people talk about it all the time. I'm grateful. You know what I'm more grateful for than anything else? I'm grateful to alcohol. Alcohol kept me alive long enough to get here. That's it. That's exactly the tool that had driven me into a state of absolute nothingness. That when I got to you, all I wanted to do was die. All I wanted to do was find some place to sit down, and I spent 
two years trying to get somebody to kill me by, by actions, not because of anything else. And I've come to you out of a penitentiary not knowing anything about living in society as a working human being. And I learned things about it for 50 some odd years now, how to go to work, come home, pay my bill, raise my children, play with my grandchildren, and most of all, you taught me through your actions how to love you. Forks and all. So I can go home and tell my wife that I love her. I can put my arms around her in the morning and we can say a little prayer together. I go to bed at night and all the prayers are about the people in my life that I've loved and gotten close to. Why I come here every week is not so I can stay sober. I come here every week so I can try to put back a little in the Alcoholics Anonymous for the great reward you and my sponsor and my wife and the other people around here have given me. That's why I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, not to stay sober, not to not get loaded or not to do nothing crazy. I come here because I've been given a tremendous gift. And one night I went to see an old lady who comes to the penitentiary. She was laying in a hospital. And I went to see her, and I didn't know how to tell her how much I loved her because I hadn't been around her that much. And I wanted to thank her for helping me. And this is what she said to me. He says, your sobriety is a gift from God, Johnny. And what you do with your sobriety will be your gift back to God. I never have forgot that phraseology for these fancy, wonderful people who traveled up that old back road almost 60 years ago to talk to a scumbag who should have been born or burned in hell a long, long time ago. And I have this legacy that whatever I'm asked to do here in Alcoholics Anonymous, I have done to the best of my ability, no matter how feeble it is. And all I can tell you about all that is this night is I love you, and there's not much you can do about it. Thank you. Hey, birthdays. We have several birthdays tonight, so let's sing briskly and speak even brisklier. Birthday people, do not forget to pick up your candles at the cake table as you exit the podium. Our first birthday tonight is for one year for Brian. My name is Brian. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank my previous sponsor, Christine, the Midnight Mission, the Yard, and my wonderful sponsor, Yvonne. Happy birthday. Our next birthday is for two years for Nilo. I got so much pressure. Um, I'm Nilo. I'm an alcoholic. I'd like to thank God, my sponsor, Guy Britton, uh, my previous sponsor, Hilda F., uh, my grand sponsor, Marty S., AA as a whole, and all of you. Happy birthday, Nilo. Our next birthday is also for two years for Santiago. Santiago alcoholic. <laughs> I want to thank God, uh, my sponsor, Tom, um, for the Pacific Group. Thank you. Happy birthday. Our next birthday is also for two years for Amanda. Happy Amanda J. Alcoholic. Amanda. I'd like to thank God, my sponsor Leslie, my sober family, and the women's stag. Happy birthday, Amanda. Our next birthday is for nine years for Bobby. Hi, Bobby Alcoholic. Hi. Well, thank God, my sponsor Dave, and all of you. And a ceramic cake. <laughs> Happy birthday, Bobby. Our next birthday is for 12 years for Bill. Ah. Uh, my name is Bill, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> I'd like to thank God, Clancy, my sponsor, Don D., and the class of 2007. <laughs> Happy birthday. 
Our next birthday is for 17 years for Bob. Bob. I want to thank God, AA, PG, John, Clancy, Claudia. Happy birthday, Bob. Our next birthday is for 19 years for Stephanie. Stephanie Alcoholic. And I'd like to thank uh, Clancy, Pacific Group, um, my wonderful sober husband, Tom, that I love so much, um, my wonderful sponsor, Claire, that's been sponsoring me for over 11 years now. I'm so grateful for all of our help, and I'm so grateful to all of you. Thanks. Happy birthday. Our next birthday is for 24 years for Sean. I'm Sean. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I want to thank wonderful Claire for another year of sponsorship. Um, I want to thank my uh, husband, Lonnie. Um, I want to thank my friends, especially Veronica, who came out to support me tonight, um, specifically Pacific Group and all of you guys, and Clancy. Thanks. Happy birthday, Sean. Our next birthday is for 30 years for Jerry. Jerry Chavez, alcoholic. Uh, I'd like to thank God for getting me here and keeping me here. I'd like to thank uh, Tom for 29 years, uh, Joe S. for my first year. Uh, he does that every year. <laughs> <That's really> <laughs> 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 uh, I'd like to thank the old timers, especially Clancy, the guys who call me sponsor, Roger, Kent, and Dave, uh, my family, class of 89, and uh, all of you. All right, we're almost there. Our next birthday is for 31 years for Frank. My name is Francisco and I am an alcoholic. I want to thank my sponsor, my grand sponsor, uh, Clancy, all of you. Uh, thank you for being part of my life. I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I love you all. Thank you. Happy birthday to the most interesting man in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Our next birthday is for 32 years for Tim. And Tim Alcoholic. Yeah. I'd like to thank God, Clancy, for providing a safe place. Everybody back in uh, Belfast, especially John the Book and John the Camera. Um, my brothers and all my family. Phil, my sponsor, for his support, and the love of my life, Lisa, for keeping me on the street and narrow, even when I don't want to stay on the street and narrow, and, um, and all of you, thank you very much. Happy birthday, Tim. Our next birthday is for 34 years for Al. I'm Al, I'm an alcoholic. For the uh, 23rd consecutive year, I'd like to thank my sponsor, Joe, for giving me a cake on my AA birthday. I'd like to thank my two previous sponsors, looking down from above, probably in bewilderment, Barney Morris and John Stockdale. I'd like to thank those of us who came alive in 85. I'd like to thank my normie wife, who, if she lets me, will be married 55 years in August. I'd like to thank PG Golf for allowing this octogenarian to play golf with them. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to thank each and every one of you. Our next birthday is for 37 years for Larry. Hi, everybody. My name is Larry Thomas, and I'm an alcoholic. It's an honor and a privilege to thank Johnny Clancy and all of you. Happy birthday, Larry. Our next birthday is for 40 years for Matt. Hi, Matt Tricky, alcoholic. I thank my sponsor, Joe, my AA brothers, the PG Men's Stag, the guys I sponsor, class, the class of 1934 and 1935. And uh, I'd like to thank my, my lovely wife and our two, two boys that came out tonight to watch me take my cake, and especially Clancy, the architect. What a, what a great group to be in for most of my life. So thank you. 
That's uh, all the birthdays for a total of 15 birthdays for a total of 292 years, which is an average of 19.5 years per birthday.